All right, hello and welcome to, it is National Pollinator Week. So you've probably seen on our Facebook page, we have been blowing it up with all sorts of facts about pollinators. And we're gonna dive a little deeper today. But first, before we get started, I have a couple of things to tell you about. And that is, if you like what you've been seeing on these videos, then please actually like the video. We wanna see that you like it. We wanna see those likes, it helps us out a lot. Um, it also helps us out a lot if you share those videos. So you should actually share this video onto your page because that also helps. Remember as we go through the video to ask questions. Um, we want to see those questions. We want to answer. If you want any clarification on anything, let us do that. If the video is already over, please continue to ask questions. We still want to see them and we will answer the best that we can. Also, if you're looking for ways to celebrate National Pollinator Week, remember to come out and visit here at the Nature Center. And you can help out with pollinators by contributing to us because we are a nonprofit organization. We rely on donors and memberships and also visitors here to the Nature Center. So when you come and pay your admission to hike on the trails, you're actually helping us out a lot and it helps us continue to do programs like what you're seeing today so that we can contribute to pollinator education. So just remember that and it helps us out. If you have certain topics in the future that you'd like to, for us to talk about and teach about for you to learn, then put it in the comments. We wanna know topics that you are interested in so that in the future we can talk to you about things that you want to learn about. All right, let's get started. So for Pollinator Week, I know we've done previous videos where we've talked about native bees. We've also talked about the non-native honeybee. So we're going to delve a little deeper into other pollinators today. So we want to remember that with it being National Pollinator Week, we are talking about native pollinators. So I have my bee friends, my honeybee friends, right over there in our apiary. We know that those are valuable pollinators, but those are our non-native friends. So they are actually agricultural livestock. They've been domesticated, been bred for hundreds of years for producing honey and pollinating crops and things like that. And they're not nearly in as much trouble as our native pollinator friends because they're actually bred kind of like cattle. And so while raising cattle can be difficult and challenging, raising bees can also be challenging, but not in the same way that our wild pollinator friends are in. So we're gonna talk about our wild native friends, not the honeybee today. And you've probably, if you watch the native bee episode, then you have probably got to learn a little bit about native bees um, then as well. And we're gonna delve into other things. And I wanna to talk to you about some things that are pollinators that you might not have ever thought about. And I have some plants today. And so one of these plants, this is wild ginger. And it has these pretty heart-shaped leaves. If I were to crumple up the leaf, it would smell really nice. And I actually dug it up by the root because this part's important. Because this root would be under the ground. And this is also called little brown jug because this part that's under the ground, if I were to take away the leaf litter and look, there would be this little brown uh, flower that would be almost buried under the leaf litter right here at the base. And that's important because this plant is actually pollinated by flies. So that's right, flies can be pollinators too. And the flower itself actually, it opens up, it actually kind of smells a little funny. It's meant to look a little bit like rotting something decaying, so it attracts flies. And that's where this really cool plant uh, has its flower where you can't even see it unless you go digging for it. And so it blooms in the early spring and the little flies actually go in there and they seek shelter in the flowers and they are seen going in there collecting pollen, pollinating the flowers for this wild ginger. So that's a pollinator that we don't think about. And then I've got another cool plant, also early spring bloomer. This is bloodroot and so it can have, this is a pretty distinctive leaf. Um, we talk about it looking kind of like frog fingers. It also can not have as many frog fingers. So there's a lot of variation in its leaf. This is as big as it gets. It has a beautiful white flower in the early spring. The flower actually does not produce any nectar. It just produces pollen. And a lot of things like that pollen, including the native bee group, the minor bees, um, but also beetles and flies will come to it and ants. And so the ants actually will come, they take the pollen, they eat it, 
and they pollinate it. But when the seed has been created, the blood root does something rather interesting. It creates a seed that has a special attachment to it. And that attachment is very attractive to ants. The ants pick the seed, they take it back to their nest, they eat that little attachment that is so tasty and attractive to them, and they discard the seed to the blood root far away from the parent plant, thereby planting the seed of the blood root. And that is how the blood root disperses itself around. So they are great pollinators and also seed dispersers. So that's something that you never thought about ants being pollinators, but they are. So flies, beetles, uh, ants, those, those are all pollinators. Another cool animal, and we hinted at this, we talked about this a little bit on Facebook, are wasps. And so this is a paper wasp nest. They take a uh, wood, they chew up the wood, with their, mix it with their saliva, and they're able to make this paper nest. Usually you see it, see it hanging upside down, little umbrella like this and they live inside and it's usually one queen and uh, she'll have uh, lay her eggs in here and she'll a paper wasp typically has a small colony there's also solitary wasp that will make different kinds of nest as well there's potter wasp this is a uh, potter wasp where they've made a mud nest and they lay their eggs in here there's also different types of digger wasps that lay their eggs inside just down in the ground so solitary wasps are very gentle. So this is a type of potter wasp. This is considered a solitary wasp, a potter wasp. Um, they have no interest in you whatsoever. They don't build a hive. They don't build up large colonies. So if it sees you, it's not interested in you. It doesn't protect or guard anything. It's a very good pollinator. It collects lots of pollen and nectar and goes from flower to flower. It also, is carnivorous as well. So when it's not collecting pollen and nectar, it also is eating different insects, including pest insects in your garden. So they are doing two services in your garden. They're collecting pest insects and they're also pollinating. So that's really neat. There are lots of other types of wasps and even these paper wasps, their colonies don't get that big and they're still pollinating. And paper wasps are not to be confused with yellow jackets that are very aggressive. Paper wasps are actually pretty calm and docile as long as you don't disturb their nest. Um, they guard their nest, but when you see them out and about, particularly on flowers and things like that, they're not going to come after you. A yellow jacket's a different story, but a paper wasp will not disturb you. And they're actually great pollinators and also great at um, taking down uh, uh, different types of insects. Mud daubers. You've probably seen these on the sides of buildings and things like this. And if I flip this over, you're going to see inside, they've actually filled it up with different spiders. So there's different types of mud daubers. They prey on different things. They will pollinate and they will also collect um, different types of caterpillars and, and spiders and things like that to feed to their young. So they are pollinators as well as um, they'll protect your garden from different types of pests. So that's something neat as well. All right, so we've talked about wasps and flies, beetles, ants, and let's talk about, we know moths. So this is the cocoon of a luna moth wrapped in leaves. So moths are good pollinators to, to different things at night. So moths fly at night, butterflies fly in the day. And we've also got some butterflies to show you today and so if you saw Miss Susan's early explorer program you probably got to learn about butterflies and so I'm going to show you some we've got some butterflies here this is a gulf fritillary butterfly look at that pearly iridescence on the on this side of the wings um, the host plant the larval host plant of this butterfly is the passion vine and you can plant it it grows very easily um, and you can, it's also called a maypop, the fruit's edible, and so you can plant them and watch those caterpillars grow, and these are typically late summer. Um, another type of butterfly is the black swallowtail. There's a lot of different swallowtails that are this general kind of color. This is the black swallowtail, um, one of our mini swallowtail butterflies that are here in Alabama, and I've got a few more butterflies to show you 
our state butterfly, which you learned last week, or was the week before, is the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. It has a black form and its yellow form. There's the Gulf Fritillary, um, looking at the inside of the wings. There's also the Cloudless Sulfur, very common summer butterfly. And then we have a few different uh, moth species as well here. So just to show you some of the diversity of some of Alabama's butterflies, and I can even show you some posters. We have lots of posters. We like posters here at the Nature Center of common butterflies of Alabama. Look at that. We have so many different butterfly species here in Alabama. And if you want to learn more about butterflies, uh, I have some books that I can show you. So this is a great book. This is Butterflies of Alabama. So all the butterflies that you can find in Alabama, this is a fantastic book if you want to learn more about butterflies. And then particularly if you're seeing them as caterpillars, because butterflies do go through metamorphosis, this one is caterpillars of Eastern North America. So you can identify them when they're in their caterpillar phase. So that's a very handy book to have as well. So really recommend these two books for getting to know your butterflies. And of course, we have to talk about the famous butterfly. We have to talk about the monarch butterfly. So we've talked about it a little bit. We talked about it on Monday. And the monarch butterfly is famous and one of the most well-studied butterfly species because it does make that great migration. And I do have a map showing that it can travel all the way up to Canada and every year it makes this migration all the way down to Mexico. And so that's just amazing how this it does that. It has basically an internal compass. And one of the things that's contributed to their decline, it's many things, but one of the biggest things is that their larvae, so their caterpillars, can only eat milkweed. Now there are several different milkweed species out there, but uh, we're going to show you some of those species, but they have to have milkweed to be able to survive. So if they're laying their eggs, they need to lay it on milkweed. And if they don't have that, their caterpillar is not going to be able to survive. Now the adults use many different nectar sources. So it's really important to have nectar sources that they like, especially on their migration routes. And if you go back to our post where we talked about monarchs, you can learn more about how you can get involved in monarch research because you can actually do some citizen science projects where you can learn how to tag monarch butterflies and be a part of research, which is really neat that you can get involved and do that. And we'll talk a little bit more about milkweed in a second. All right, and to talk about another, an, an underappreciated, I think, uh, pollinator is the hummingbird. And so this is a deceased uh, hummingbird that we have here. And we have a special permit to keep um, dead migratory birds here because we're an education facility. And so this poor thing was one that had run into a glass, uh, glass window, which is something that unfortunately happens to different birds. And so it's preserved so that we can use it for education. And just so that we can show you the size, I mean, that is a very small bird and its wings are out, but it is very, very tiny, very small and it has this very long beak to be able to go into uh, a flower to be able to get nectar out. It's specially adapted for dipping its beak and its long tongue to be able to get nectar out of flowers. And so pollinators are specially adapted for their flower uh, counterparts to be great pollinators. And this is a specially adapted bird for that. Not an insect pollinator, a bird pollinator. And you can see that beautiful iridescence on there. And one thing that you can do, that some of you might have already done, is put out a hummingbird feeder. Now a couple of things about hummingbird feeders is make sure that if you put a hummingbird feeder, put it out the right time of year. Research your, your hummingbird feeder when's the right time to put it out and things like that. Make sure you clean your hummingbird feeder frequently. So when the weather is hot, they recommend to clean out your hummingbird feeder and replace the sugar water twice a week 
You want to make sure that it doesn't get moldy or anything like that because it can really hurt the hummingbirds if they're drinking out of a feeder that's gotten moldy. So you want to scrub it well with soap and water. Um, and you want to make sure that you put the, the liquid that you put in it is four parts to one part of water to sugar. And that you don't add any red food coloring. That used to be a thing. You put red food coloring in it to attract them. Don't do that because they can make them sick. They will come to this. Once they find it, don't worry about it more will come. They're attracted to the little red flowers that are on the hummingbird feeder. Um, some of the hummingbird uh, feeders are actually red themselves just to attract them. So you don't need to put any uh, dyes in there to get them to come to that. That will actually hurt them. So that's something that you can do to uh, help out your hummingbird friends and attract them to your area as well as planting plants for hummingbirds and we're going to talk about that. And then we can talk about bees. And we're not going to talk much about bees because we've already talked about bees, but I do have a couple of bee friends to show you, just to show you the diversity of bees. These are some native bees that have been collected um, around, and we've been trying to identify bee species, including this little teeny tiny, teeny tiny bee right there. Look at that tiny bee. And North America has over 4,000 native bee species, so we're not including the honeybee in that. These are all different kinds of other bees. And I particularly want to show you four bees here. This is um, an eastern bumblebee. Look at that fuzzy, fuzzy abdomen. You can tell it's a bumblebee. This is a large one. So a summer bumblebee. In the springtime they're kind of small. This is a nice eastern carpenter bee. Shiny abdomen. Okay. So you can tell that. And then this wee little one right here. Shiny abdomen, but small shape differently very very long uh, antenna that's a eastern blueberry bee southeastern blueberry bee I'm sorry especially pollinates uh, blueberries and is not typically found um, you don't see it other times of the year it's only out when there's when blueberries are in season better at pollinating blueberries than honeybees are so those are some really cool bees we've talked about native bee houses and I just want to reiterate that you can put native bee houses out. If you don't want to buy those fancy ones in the store, you can make one. This is just a block of wood with different size holes drilled in for different types of bees. And the design on this one, it has these little hooks here so that you can hang it. But you really don't want to hang it where it can sway in the wind. That's actually not good. It would probably be better to hang it like this with an L bracket onto a post so that it doesn't move. And it is very important that if you do hang out these, that you preferably have smaller ones spaced apart. You don't want too many congregated in the same area because they can spread diseases. You also want it firmly mounted so it doesn't jostle around the larva. It helps if you can take them inside over the winter. The larva, once they've all been put in here, you store them safely inside. There's ways that you can do that and read about it and how to do it safely and all of that. And then after they've all hatched out in the spring that you thoroughly clean all of this. Preferably discard this all together and make a new one just so you're not spreading diseases that the bees can get. Um, ways that you can have the little tubes or something where you can either clean them really well or replace them is the best way to go. All right, so we want to talk about how you can help pollinators and so the reason we care about pollinators, you know, pollinators are in decline. For a lot of reasons. Habitat loss is a big reason. And we talked about how some of these, oh, there was a real butterfly that came and landed over here. Um, we want to talk about uh, why that's important. It might help to understand what pollination is. So plants, flowers, they have to have pollination. This is a perfect flower. It has male parts and female parts. Some plants only have one or the other. Um, plants usually need cross-pollination to be most productive. So that means that they need pollen from the male parts to reach the stigma, the female parts, of a different flower. Okay, so that means that a pollinator comes to the flower, usually right here where the nectar source is, um, it brushes against the, um, the anthers which has the pollen on it and it gets it all over itself. It goes to another flower and it lands, it gets that pollen on the stigma of the female part and pollination occurs, which means it can produce a seed. Pollination, so seed is the little flower baby, so pollination has to happen in order for the flower to make a baby, okay? So that has to happen if you want there to be more flowers. 
So that's why pollination is so important. Now, if you think about this, some flower babies, so the seeds are in things like fruits. And so if you really want fruits, like, I don't know, say a fig, so this little fruit, then you need pollination to occur. Guess what pollinates a fig? A wasp. Wasp pollinate figs. So that has to happen. This is the little plant baby of this uh, fig tree and a wasp had to go from flower to flower. Now sometimes it can go, it, you have to look, sometimes it can go from flower to flower on the same plant. Sometimes it has to go from two different plants. It just depends. Um, but insect pollinators or bird pollinators or some kind of pollinators, that has to happen in order for this process to work. So if you like fruits or nuts or veggies, things like that, then you need pollinators. Pollinators are responsible for having our food. Um, we talked about this little blueberry bee. It's responsible for a lot of your blueberries. Squash bees, they're responsible for your squashes and your watermelons. Watermelon time is upon us. And squash bees are responsible for a lot of watermelon pollination. So thank a bee for that. Look at this. It's got its tongue out. It must taste some sugar there. So this is a little, I can't tell, I think it's an American lady butterfly. I'm not quite so sure. But she's got her little proboscis out. Butterflies actually can taste with their feet, which is funny. So when they land on something, their little feet can feel if there's sugar there or not. Just anything tasty. So she obviously landed, tasted something, and she's trying to see if she can get some up with her little tongue. Very neat. All right, so in order for pollinators to pollinate what we want while they're going around they need lots of other things to eat and especially because some of the things that we want them to pollinate are only there at certain times of the year what about the other times of the year okay they need things all the time so that's why it's really important for people to plant things for them to eat all throughout the year so pollinators are able to eat things and have things to keep them strong especially to get through the winter so that they can be there to pollinate the things that especially we really like them to pollinate. So that's why it's important to plant for pollinators. It's really important to plant for things that are native because our native pollinators need native plants. They're specially adapted for it. So to show you some things that you can plant in your yard, especially things that are really pretty and are nice that help out pollinators. Let's see, for hummingbirds, we have a couple of different things. This is a very pretty vine called coral honeysuckle. It's a native plant. Hummingbirds really like it, and it's beautiful. Other things will come to this, but you can see it's specially adapted for, for hummingbirds. It's red, it attracts them, it's long and tubular, it's made for their beaks and their long tongues. And then we also have something, you've probably seen this, this is trumpet vine. It's growing way up in the trees right now. We just were able to get the flowers that actually fell, fell down specially designed for hummingbirds. You can buy this at stores that specialize in selling native plants, and there's quite a bit of them around Alabama. And then we also have something called, this is Turk's Cap, it grows as a bush. It's very pretty. This will also attract butterflies and bees as well. So these are things that you can easily incorporate into your landscaping that will help out um, different pollinators. Now, this is something, this is a uh, bee balm. It looks a little rough because it got rained on pretty badly. Bee balm is one of those that it is good for butterflies, bees, moths, uh, bee flies. Uh, all sorts of pollinators love this. It is abundant in nectar production. It blooms profusely in the summertime. Uh, it, it's a very very good native plant for your pollinators. It's easy, easy, easy to grow. It's beautiful. It comes in a couple of different varieties. This is something that's very nice to add to your garden. And um, you know, when you're thinking about growing certain plants, make sure that you plant a variety for different kinds of pollinators so that you have stuff for a lot of them because we do have a lot of biodiversity. We have this butterfly just hanging out with us. She must know we're talking about her. She is just chilling out there. 
still trying to see if she can taste something. And this is a, an aster, a Stokes aster. Um, this is, there are lots of different aster species. There's aster species that bloom in the summer, and then there's also lots of aster species that, grew, that bloom in the fall. So it's really important if you're planting a pollinator garden or any garden uh, that you're considering things that bloom in the early spring, in the mid spring, in the early summer, mid summer, some things that'll bloom maybe in the heat of the summer. So uh, there's some sunflower species that really like the heat of the summer. Swamp sunflower is a native species that blooms in the really hottest part of the summer in the beginnings of fall. The beginning of fall here is, you know, basically still summer. <laughs> so that time of year when nothing else is blooming, if you can plant something that is blooming for pollinators, that's extremely helpful. And then you want something that blooms in the fall. Asters are great to plant so that there's actually something blooming in the fall for the pollinators. And then you can even find some things that bloom in the winter, which winter honeysuckle is another thing, also called kiss me at the gate. That's another flower that blooms even in the winter time that's great for bees and pollinators. A lot of things have gone kind of underground and they're waiting winter out, but there are still going to be some things you know as well as I do that here in Alabama you're going to have some warm days and those pollinators are going to come up thinking that it's spring and it's not and it's helpful for them to have something that they can go to and have some food. Um, I really recommend this book if you're wanting to learn more about how to help pollinators out. This is a very great resource. It talks about how you can help pollinators, planting for pollinators. It goes into different host plants. It goes into pollinator species and specifically each one and meeting their needs. This book, I mean, I found it on Amazon. It wasn't that expensive. It's great. If you're serious about getting into helping out pollinators, this is a fantastic book for doing that. Goldenrod is also another one that is really great for the fall. So we've been working on this pollinator field for quite some time. Right now it has milkweed species, black-eyed Susan, different types of Coreopsis, um, cauliflower, and it, in, the, in the fall it's going to have some goldenrod species. And a lot of people think that goldenrod is going to affect their allergies, but goldenrod is actually insect pollinated which means that the pollen grains are very, very heavy. They actually don't blow in the wind and affect your allergies. They actually stay there on the plant waiting for a pollinator to come pick them up. You see them and people associate them with allergies because they're big and yellow, but it's usually the ragweed that grows right next to the goldenrod that's affecting your allergies, not the goldenrod. Goldenrod is actually beautiful though. There's a lot of different species that you can have fun planting and incorporating in your garden. And don't worry about it affecting your allergies. It's really beneficial for pollinators. And you, if you think about certain things that you're doing in your life, you can help out pollinators without having to do as much. Just like not mowing certain things. So think about not mowing the ditches or not mowing the fence row. Or if you have a hay field, a lot of people mow as soon as that goldenrod pops up wait until it's done blooming to mow because that goldenrod is the last little bit that the pollinators have before winter starts and they are able to stock up on a lot of things right then and have a lot of energy uh, before they go into winter and so it's really important that if you can just leave that goldenrod that's a big step in helping pollinators um, a lot of the reason that uh, mo uh, monarchs are in decline is milkweed and we talked about that and it's related to the fact that people like to try to keep the edges of the roads very clean and tidy and we spray them and we mow them and things like that well that's where milkweed likes to grow and so by keeping them all clean and tidy we've actually gotten rid of a lot of milkweed and so that's why the monarchs are are in decline and so having an area of your yard that you even just let grow messy even if it's a small section and let some native flowers and things grow up, that will go a long way in helping your native pollinators because they like these native plants and this is great habitat for them right here. And if you were to look uh, closer, you would see there's so much butterfly, bee, wasp action. And I'm wa I've walked through here, this wasp are not the least bit interested in me, those bees are not the least bit interested in me. 
They have not ever stung me. They are pollinating. They've got a job to do. They are furiously working. Um, they're not protecting a nest or anything like that, so they're not guarding anything. Um, you don't have to worry about this being a danger to yourself or kids or anything like that by having this many bees and wasps out there working on the, on the flowers or anything because unless you're actually trying to catch them in your hands, you don't have to worry about them bothering you. They are at work working those flowers and trying to get as much pollen and nectar as they can um, before the day's out. They're hard workers. Do we have any questions? All right. And so those are some tips that we have for how you can um, incorporate some simple things into, into your life when it comes to helping out pollinators. And another thing that's uh, when you, you often hear about herbicides and insecticides, and we've talked about this before, you can utilize those things as long as you're being conscious about how it's used. So if you use herbicides and insecticides according to the label guidelines, you can be safe with certain things. Um, you can do your research, you can find certain herbicides are better than others at being safe for bees. Um, they actually have a ranking system, so certain ones are ranked uh, worse than the others, so you can do your research. But a lot of times, um, especially for insecticides and herbicides, you want to make sure that you're using a liquid, not a powder. Because if you think about it, powder is a lot like pollen. Um, you put it on your plants, it's going to be there for a long time, and the bee visits the flower and it's just like pollen. It gets all over the bee. Uh, or the butterfly or anything else and that's not good. It carries it back to its home and it hurts the animal. So powders are no-go. They're really bad for pollinators. But if you use a liquid, especially if you use a liquid at night, it dries by the next day. So at night while well, most of the pollinators are sleeping and it renders it safe. Um, and you don't want to spray it directly on flowers. So you can spray it on a plant, but not on the flowers, and it limits its contact with actual pollinators, making it much, much safer. So do your research um, about things like that, and that's how you can utilize those things, but actually be conscious about pollinators and making it safe for them. A lot of times when it comes to uh, herbicides and insecticides, we just have this, it's a secondary effect. So herbicides, people just trying to mow weeds, they try to, or trying to eliminate weeds like dandelions, okay? So that's just a secondary effect of an herbicide. So it's not the herbicide directly that did the killing, it's that it got rid of a valuable resource for a pollinator. So dandelions are very important for pollinators because it's one of the only things blooming in the early, early spring. And so if you go through with an herbicide and you get rid of all the dandelions, when there's nothing else blooming, they have nothing else to eat. And so that's a way that herbicides are affecting a resource for pollinators. So think about those things, do your research. If you have any questions about um, pollination, about pollinators, about planting for pollinators, native plants, things like that, um, I'd love to answer your questions. Let's walk out here. We have a question. We have a question. Do you know of any natural herbicides or insecticides that would be better to use? There are some out there and you can research some. I've heard of people using like neem oil and some things like that. Uh, you have to do research about how effective they are and it really just depends on, on what you're wanting to use it for, um, what you're targeting. Um, I've heard there are some tricks and things that from what I've heard some of those things are not as effective um, but it was, you know if you're happy with that then that's fine you know use that instead but um, some of those things that are supposed to be irritating for insects if you're trying to get rid of an insect on your plant it's still going to be irritating for the bees and things as well so you have to do some research if you're trying to get insects off your plant then anything you use is probably also going to get pollinators off your plant too. And that can be problematic if you're wanting them to pollinate your plant. So you have to kind of really think through what you're using, how it works, what it does, and research how to use it. 
Um, sometimes if they're lingering on your plant and uh, something negative lingering on your plant, pollinators are flying to your plant, pollinators leave for the night, and you can go through and spray that uh, bad pest and then that dries, the pollinators come back uh, the next day, then that fixes your problem. So, you know, you can use that herbicide effect or that insecticide effectively by killing the pest at night if it's staying on your plant. If you have a flying insect as your pest, good luck to you. I don't, I don't, you have to do some research on, on how you're going to go about that. So you have to know what your pest is and to know what you're fighting against and know your options and how to fight it. But I will say, people who go around killing all the wasp around them are doing themselves more harm than good because those are very effective um, garden pest managers. In fact, a lot of farmers have learned that you can release wasp into their, into their farm and their croplands to help with pest management. That's a natural pest management option that's been used as biocontrol for a while now. So just know that that actually is something to consider is letting nature take its course and, and work that way. So let's look out here before we go today. We have a lot of action. I want to show you some of this butterfly milkweed. Now this is a native butterfly milkweed. This is a, a little one. We have some bigger ones, but this one's closest. So this is a Sclepias tuberosa, a native butterfly milkweed. It has ants all over it. Cool. And um, don't see any caterpillars on it yet. Might be too early. Um, be careful about the type of milkweed. There's lots of beautiful native milkweeds. Some look nothing like this. But they do sell tropical milkweed in some places. And I've, what I've read about that is if you buy tropical milkweed, encourages the monarchs to stay around too long and not finish their migration and also because it doesn't die back and it will stay around um, diseases and pests on the plant so when the monarchs come back to visit it it can cause problems and spread diseases and pests you can research that research uh, tropical milkweed which is sold often in rows and things like that how it affects monarchs. So this is a native milkweed. Tropical milkweed's not. This is a native milkweed. But it is highly beneficial for monarchs. Uh, Black-eyed Susan, easy, easy to grow. Easy to grow from seed. It attracts a lot of different things. This is a also Black-eyed Susan. There's lots of different varieties. You've seen tons of pictures on Facebook. I know because I've been taking lots of pictures of our beautiful field because it is in full bloom and it's really hard to tell right now but um, through the camera I'm sure but if you look closely there is tons of butterfly action there's bees there's grasshoppers there's bee flies and wasps and all kinds of things moving and working these flowers and you could spend so much time here watching all the things happening and going on in here and they're just a lot of these things are just passing through this is just a nice stopping point for them to stop get their energy up move on there's another nice really nice milkweed plant but they're just they're stopping here collecting energy moving on going and doing other things, pollinating other things. All right, so please ask us some questions. Make sure you like this video to show that you, you like what you heard and you like what we're doing here. Share this video on your page and so hopefully other people can see this and like it too. And join us next week. Have a great week.